Welcome everyone to the ICA. If you could just take your seats. We're expecting a couple of people still be, they're gonna be coming in, but I thought we'd get started with the intro since we do have to introduce four fantastic artists this evening. Uh, I'm Monica Garza. I'm the Charlotte Wagner Director of Education here at the ICA. <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs> so tonight's program uh, kicks off this season's Artist Voice Lecture Series. That's a free program that provides all of us with opportunities to learn more about the creative processes of the artists exhibiting and performing here at the ICA. It's a little dark. I just want to make sure as people come in that you can see um, on the stairs. There you go. Okay. Today we will hear from four fabulous local artists, Helga Rotpunansky, Lavon Jenkins, Rasheen Fahandaj, and Josephine Halverson. So let's start with Helga. <laughs> so Helga's biography is incredibly unique, and I fear I will not be able to do it justice here, but I'll just try my best. Uh, but I do urge you all to look at her website and some of the other websites that these artists have online. Um, Helga's interest in art came at a very young age. Prior to her fleeing Estonia, it was in Vienna, her next home, where she secretly took art lessons at the Vienna Academy of the Arts while briefly attending medical school. She subsequently studied fashion design in Montreal and remained in this field of study for 18 years as a designer working in both Canada and the United States. In the 60s and in the 70s, uh, she continued her studies in art, studying at the Art Students League of New York and SMFA. El Helga has participated in numerous exhibitions throughout her career, and her works are now found in several public and private collections. Next, we have Levon. <laughs> I love it when artists have fans, like <laughs> really passionate fans. So earlier this year, uh, WBUR interviewed Levon, where he stated, quote, I'm painting what I want to make, and I'm just fortunate enough now that what I'm in love with, the art world is kind of liking it. I think that might be a little bit of an understatement. Uh, Levon was raised in Florida before his arrival in Boston. His interest in making art as a career for himself began with his studies at Roxbury Community College and continued throughout his tenure at Mass Art. Since graduating in 2005, Levon has exhibited his work both locally and internationally. Venues include the Painting Center in New York, Suffolk University Gallery, and Beijing's Oasis Gallery. Levon is a recipient of several awards and recognitions including the 2015 Blanche E. Coleman Award and Boston's Kingston Gallery's 2016 Emerging Artist of the Year. Rasheen. Rasheen immigrated. <laughs> she immigrated to the United States from her native home of Iran and temporary home in Turkey. She pursued her studies in art at Mass Art and the San Francisco Art Institute. Since then, her work has focused primarily on social, cultural, and political issues. In 2016 and 17, she partnered with the Mayor's Office of Art and Culture via the Boston Artist in Residency Program. Her work has been presented locally at Boston Center for the Arts, Boston City Hall Square, and also with the Boston International Film Festival. Internationally, she has presented her work in cities such as Vancouver and Paris. This year, she was named a 2019 Mass Cultural Artist Fellow and was awarded a residency with ThoughtWorks Arts, an incubating program for artists and technologies to technologists to collaborate. She was a fellow at the MIT Open Documentary Lab last year and is currently an assistant professor at Emerson College. <laughs> And we have Josephine. <laughs> Josephine is a native of Cape Cod. She studied art at the Cooper Union School of Art, Yale, and Columbia University. She has been granted three-year-long three fellowships in Europe, including a United States Fulbright in Vienna and the Rome Prize at the French Academy. She is the recipient of several awards, including the Louis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Award in 2009 and a New York Foundation for the Arts Award in 2010, and was also granted an artist residency 
in New York, France, and most recently in Captiva, Florida, with the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation. From 2010 to 2016, she served as critic and senior critic at Yale School of Arts MFA program of painting. Halverson subsequently joined BU as professor of art and chair of graduate studies in painting, where she remains. These fabulous artists will all be joined on the stage by Mannion family curator Ruth Erickson. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth organized this year's exhibition, as you all well know. Now, before I turn this over to Ruth and the artists, we want to thank just a few people, uh, key people here. We're very, very thankful to James and Audrey Foster, who have generously endowed the exhibition and the prize at the ICA, and to Citizen M, who presented tonight's public celebration. And with that, but with that, without further ado, please help me welcome the artist and Ruth Erickson. Great, thank you so much for being here with us tonight on this rainy night. I saw so many artists and friends and supporters and it really means a lot for um, all of us to have you here uh, for the opening of the 2019 James and Audrey Foster Prize. And I know a lot of things have been said and uh, we don't need any more applause because everyone's been well applauded, but I do have to thank you all publicly. You are four really incredible artists. I feel so lucky to have been working with you on these exhibitions. You all worked so, so hard to make the bodies of work on view upstairs and so I just just deeply thank each of you for, for your work and your friendship and your uh, collaboration over this past time that we've been working on the show. And I also want to say to Jim and Audrey, where are you? There you are. Um, you know, you are such amazing friends to the ICA and to so many arts organizations in Boston. And I think one quality that I really, you know, appreciate so much about you is that you really are devoted to and believe in and to participate in the thriving Boston art scene. And I just walked through Nick Cave's Joy Parade with you a couple weekends ago. I see you at events and your you know, endowment of this prize and exhibition is really so, I'm so grateful for it. So thank you so much. Okay, so this evening we will have a chance to talk about these four artists' really distinctive bodies of work and their practices, but I wanted to begin with a kind of group question. Um, and this is a prize that's focused on Boston area artists, and I would love for each of you to reflect on the city, the place where you live and where you work. Some of you were born or in here, some of you went to school here, and just what has this city given to you as artists and given to your work? How do you see your work kind of growing up and being connected with Boston? Anybody can start. I'm the closest. You're the closest. Yeah. And I probably have the weirdest story, I think. Uh, I wouldn't be an artist if I didn't come to Boston. So I kind of owe this city uh, everything. You know, I learned about art and I got to meet culturally just at such a huge uh, array of people. Uh, growing up in a small town in Florida, it, everyone kind of looked like me, you know? So uh, being hurled into this world of creativity and um, I could not, I would not have thought about it without being Boston. So uh, I, I love Boston a lot, you know? So in a sense, without making it crazy and emotional. <laughs> Helga, do you want to go next? I haven't spent much time in Boston, but still, it has been my favorite city in many, many ways because it has reminded me of Europe. I find it very exciting because of all the many schools here, of young people, and naturally I went to school here. I went to school at the Museum of Fine Arts who taught me acrylics. It's the first time I started using acrylic painting. I have been painting in many other media, 
And it, this was something which was very new for me. And I find Boston very colorful, lively, moving. This is why probably I want lots of movement in my paintings. And it still is. There's another favorite city, but Boston is definitely one of them. <laughs> In, in, in my personal life, I think um, the people that I meet every day, the spaces that I walk in every day, uh, the institutions that I work with, uh, they, they reshape me every day. Uh, and I feel that sort of how, who I am uh, reflects on my work. So um, Boston has been second home. I, in a, soon enough, I think it would be, uh, I spend the same amount of time that I spend in Iran that I spent um, here. Uh, so I think that has profound impact on how you look at the world and how you process the world in your, in, in your work. But also I think in a, another specific way, Boston has been very profound in the past few years because of the opportunities that it's created for uh, arts and especially public art. And my work is very much um, community engaged. Uh, and I want to thank, like I have so many people that they worked on this project and I have to thank them at the beginning. I have so many collaborators. It's a, such a co-creation process. And I really appreciate all of you uh, who have been on this journey with me. Um, and, and it would have not been possible, like I think uh, without, without it. And I think the mayor's office was an, an, a beginning for me to kind of think about how I can bring this practice to the public space and to be engaged in, in, in the community in a way that I can see the reflection of the work. Uh, and that has changed my process from being a studio artist to a public artist, and, and it has been profound. Uh, so I think the opportunities also, that, and the shift that Boston had in the, in the past few years has been crucial. Um, I'm pretty new to Boston as well, um, although I'm from Massachusetts, but I had never spent much time here in the city. And um, I, and yet at the same time, uh, it was where my um, father's family was from. And so for me, the city is a city of kind of inheritance um, uh, and something that seems like it goes way back, and, but I haven't explored. So I'm still in the process of exploring it. Um, secondly, I would say Boston for me is a city of institutions and I teach here. And um, like so many of you all said, it's the people um, that have really made the city. And I think, um, and I think, seeing of course the art in the museums, but the people who are making it right now and making it happen institutionally is really what Boston means to me. Okay, we don't have time for every artist's amazing <laughs> answer to get applause. Um, PJ, I'm having a little trouble advancing this. Keep it going. Keep it going. <laughs> okay, let's stop there. Um, all right, so Levon, um, you describe your works as paintings, though they are three-dimensional. Uh, they could also be called sculptures. So I wanted to start just by asking you why you call them paintings. What is it that you're attached to about painting? And maybe we can go forward a few more images um, so we can kind of see one of the details. Yeah, so it's, it's very simple. Um, <laughs> one day, uh, Philip Guston, who I think most of you know, um, visited me in a dream. And, <laughs> and and gave me a crit, and uh, in that crit, uh, one of the things that we talked about was where he felt my work could go, and I could get more out of it. And uh, we talked about the edges of things, and how working two dimensionally, uh, when you hit the end of the canvas or the paper, that was kind of the end, and we had to stop. And uh, he said, I shouldn't stop. And one way to guarantee that 
as if I figured out a way how to make my two-dimensional paintings become three-dimensional. Uh, so from the beginning, I always thought about them as paintings. I never thought about them as sculpture, uh, even though the process of making the structures and things like that is that of a sculpture. So in a sense, I guess they are, but I'm also stubborn. And, and I'm a painter, so whatever I do, it's painting. Uh, it, whatever I'm eating or thinking, it's, it's paint. You know, and, uh, and that's kind of how I think about uh, the mark making and things like that. Uh, I'm not a great writer, uh, so I try to paint the words. Or if I'm feeling a certain way and uh, my emotions and, and uh, how I feel in those moments or stories that I hear from people, uh, I try to convey them through paint. And that leads into uh, figures having arms, uh, having not the postures and things that they go, they tell these stories uh, for themselves. You know, these characters, these figures, they can tell you more about what they are and who they are than I can. You know, I just pulled the thing together, like uh, uh, the mender, or I learn now in sewing uh, the hem. And, uh, and it's that bridge between two things, uh, sculpture and painting, and I kind of hold those things together and kind of make them like a marriage where things have to work together. And to have a good relationship, we both need to agree and give a little bit. So I take a little bit from sculpture, but never forgetting about painting. And I thought if I could make these function or uh, the way I want them to be, to be received, uh, I would have to figure out a way how to make that work. And a part of that would be me making them as painterly as possible. So I can always tie them back to uh, the foundation of painting. And that way, I don't have to talk. We don't have to do these talks. <laughs> that, you'll just be able to go up and see them and then your, your life experiences and your moments like today or yesterday, uh, you would seep them all into the paint anyway. And so they become more about you and you guys would have this dialogue and it would make them more uh, personable, which I think that's what, uh, for me, that's what I got a lot about painting or seeing those paintings in museums and things was my connection. I didn't care what uh, Sargent thought about his painting or what he was doing to that woman in that dress because I had my own idea and my obsessions and my wants to get out of that. And I'll try to paint that so you can do the same with mine. I and think I really, took all your questions. And you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, the range of poses is amazing. And you know, there's the, the postures and the hands. And for me, they feel like they contain psychological states. They contain relationships sure. to power. They yeah. contain relationships to greater beings, um, this kind of yeah. act of supplication. So I think those poses are, are so incredibly moving in all of your works. But you made a lot of references to art history. And I know yeah. Goya and Gustin are really important. But often when I was in your studio, you would talk a lot about fashion designers as yeah. well. Virgil Abloh, yeah. Christian Dior, Amiri, Valentino. Now um, under, undercover now. So, <laughs> so I wanted to ask about your interest in high fashion and these fashion designers yeah. and what you know, do you take from them in, in making uh, your work and, and what has kind of drawn you to, right. to that world as well as to art? I think, I think I always wanted to do fashion, even if I didn't think about it. I think somewhere inside me, uh, at the very least, I wanted to be around it. And I enjoyed sneaking over into the uh, fashion department at Mass Art and seeing what they were working on. Uh, but designers like Valentino and uh, Michael Mary, uh, the color and texture, the, the opportunities to play, uh, like they're like painters. You know, these things that they design are like wearable art. So I thought, what better way for me to incorporate this three-dimensional uh, idea uh, as a look at artists that make things three-dimensional. And fashion designers, uh, that's what they do. And, uh, and so color palettes in these things where in school we start off as freshmen and we take color study, we take form study, 
we do all these things and then we branch off into these uh, departments. But a year ago, we were all doing the same thing. So why not reference them? Photography as well as one, but uh, for fashion to see how they delve into uh, context and color and texture, it's incredible. But also, I'm not, I'm trying to change my thought process on uh, color because I'm not thinking just as a painter anymore. It's just color. And now I can take it back and make it into uh, something that's mine. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, let's go to Josephine's slides, please. So Josephine, upstairs, you have on two um, series of works. One series that you can see here um, was painted at an old mining site in Desert Valley uh, in California. And the other series was made on land around your studio in the Berkshires. Um, and I just, I was interested in what attracted you to these specific places and really what um, you look to paint for when you're, when you're looking for a subject to paint, what you're looking for. Um, well, I could start with the last question, which is I don't really know what I'm looking for until I find something. And a lot of my practice has focused around wandering and encountering something unknown to me and then getting to know it through painting. So painting for me is a way of connecting with something that I didn't really know anything about. Um, and, uh, and if I come into painting knowing too much too soon, then um, that sense of encounter is kind of lost. And painting is a way to fuse the thing with me and in the time that I paint it, not unlike photography. And, uh, just like what Levon was saying about the kind of adjacent creative fields, there are ways in which I think about my work through uh, the practice of photography, of, of finding something and seeing something and needing to be there in person with it. Um, and, um, and I don't really know until I get into it whether it's going to be of any interest. That said, um, I have been going deeper into certain um, sites um, repeatedly over the last few years, and in fact, the um, the can we go forward to the next mine sites? Some of those images, yeah. The uh, five um, uh, square-ish paintings that are upstairs were made, as as you said, Ruth, in Death Valley, um, which was a place that I've been visiting for, I think, close to ten years now. And I go out there, and um, you know, as part of a kind of um, wander and um, uh, and what's become interesting over time is actually time as a um, as a motif. So to revisit something, I've changed and it's changed. And how do how do you kind of describe that change or encounter the passage of time? Um, this is a particular site that has um, that was once used as a mine and um, has many other histories. Um, but the detritus from it was really abandoned in the 1960s. So there's something archaeological about it. Uh, and painting is a way to kind of literally unearth that. Um, the frames around all of these paintings, you can see here, that's the painting in process without the frame. Um, and the frames I made afterwards by grinding up the kind of rocks and debris that were at the site and um, putting them into these frames as a kind of evidence of the place. Um, like photography, when my work returns to somewhere else, the studio or on a wall, when it loses its original context, there's a great deal of loss that happens of where, where it was made and when it was made and why. And, and um, the frames was a way to maybe mitigate that or translate the, the wall to that experiential um, way, of, way of working. Um, uh, Similarly, with the panoramic paintings, um, uh, which I made in uh, Western Massachusetts, which is where my, my home and studio is, um, although I don't really make much in the studio other than the frames at the moment, um, but the, um, uh, these uh, panoramas were um, uh, at the kind of edges of, of um, my property and land, and I've been kind of 
myself as an artist, essentially kind of mining this perimeter, um, looking for uh, traces of, of um, time that I didn't live in or um, people who had maybe been there before or life cycles through nature um, and time. So the, the panoramics in each of these are a rotation around of the ground and, um, and has been a reflection um, in a different way than the Death Valley paintings, but also on, um, on time. In so many of these works, um, in this one, for instance, Boundary Marker, there's like this interaction that's happening between the natural world as is found and the human incursions into that natural world. And I find that kind of dynamic is something that you're drawn to a lot in throughout your various bodies of work. And I just wonder what kind of, for you, that sort of interface between those two uh, ha has, has become such an important subject for you and what kind of draws you to it? I mean, I think um, a pa painting practice like mine has its, its roots in tourism and travel. And I have traveled a lot um, and seen a lot. And uh, the question of belonging or of home and, um, has been an interesting one to me um, and how much time do we have in any given place. Um, and I think the artists, all of us have, have kind of referenced that already. Um, and uh, what does it mean to kind of be a visitor to a place or to revisit it or to have a kind of visitation from, even spiritually from, from the place um, is something that definitely makes me want to make art. Um, and, um, and I think that, that um, this more archeological or even maybe like a kind of quasi anthropological interest of mine has to do with um, really like this basic question of like, I'm standing here, um, who am I in this place and what, it, what am I doing here? Um, pretty, pretty existential basic questions, I guess, but there's a kind of, there's a kind of witnessing and um, uh, in that practice and um, not just of something else um, in the tradition of, of looking at something and making a painting of it, but in my own presence um, in that space and implicating it. These are also paintings that are made publicly outside um, and, uh, and that's important that I couldn't make them in any other place and my own presence there is, is is integral to the making of the work. And maybe as we, yeah, let's dive into some of these amazing details. Um, so I have had the opportunity, I was a visiting critic for the MFA crits at BU last um, year, and so I had the chance to sort of see you interacting with students and see you kind of in the classroom, and you are such an incredible teacher, and I'm sure many of your students that are here tonight can attest to what a, an amazing professor you are. Yeah. And. <laughs> so I wanted to um, ask you about your art making practice and your teaching and kind of how those two come together and how they, how they inform one another. I, um, I'm really glad you asked that and um, thank you to um, students past and present who are here um, and colleagues. I love teaching and I do see it as part of my practice um, and I think that uh, the more I do it the more commonalities I've found. Um, I really believe in, a, in an ethics of in-personness. Um, when I make a painting, I really have to be there. And when I teach, I really have to be there. Um, uh, these things have to, they take time and you grow together and spend time together. Um, and it's just, it's totally identical to, to painting in that way. Um, I also think that trying to kind of see more than than meets the eye is something that I am continually returning to as an artist, looking at something and trying to see more than I might have initially thought was there or um, something different at least. Um, and, um, and that kind of attention is something I find um, that also corresponds. Obviously teaching, you know, in a program like, like I do at the moment, it's like a think tank of what painting can be. And it's a, an enormous privilege to um, see how everyone is drawing such incredibly different and radically different and innovative conclusions about the possibilities. So I couldn't, it would be really difficult to not be totally inspired at all times by, by my students and, and colleagues who were all, were all trying to figure this out. And uh, you know, 
the world is not really asking for more um, art. Um, you know, in fact, it's, <laughs> it's a really hard life. Um, so the courage, um, <laughs> the courage and commitment that everyone um, puts in all the time is in itself, you know, before any actual art gets made is, um, you know, is, is uh, constantly astonishing and, um, and, and feeds directly into my paintings. I hope that, you know, that enthusiasm I have then kind of comes back into teaching, but there are only so many hours in the day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's go to Rasheen's slides now. Great. So, um, so you've spoken about your project, A Father's Lullaby, as beginning in response to the rates of incarceration of men of color and their absence uh, then within their families. But your video, and your video begins with this kind of abstracted graph that is about the increase of rates of incarceration, but it quickly gives way to song and to storytelling. And I thought we could just watch um, in the next slide just a short clip of one of the channels of your three channel piece upstairs to begin it, just to sort of give us some of the flavor. Um, and then to have you talk a little bit about what led you to song and storytelling as a way of thinking about this social justice issue. So let's play the short clip. So what kind of led you to song and storytelling? And how did that really become the kind of medium, in a way, of thinking about an issue that could be addressed in so many other kind of facets? Um, I think personal stories and narrative have profound, uh, or have the power to have profound impact and, and create connections and encounters. Uh, that it moves us beyond any form of uh, data or information. Um, and, 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 and as a human being, I, I think we have very much profound connection to each other. And having a spaces that we could encounter that or come to the spaces that we don't hear those narratives that maybe we, we hear on a daily basis is, is really important. So I think at the core of it, um, the piece is witnessing uh, each other's story and narrative, but also coming to an, a space that feels familiar, uh, because a lot of us maybe here have heard these stories, or, or um, you know, voice is very interesting, or song, or singing, because it's the first instrument in a way that like we uh, carry and we connect with each other. Um, but also, I feel. Um, Social justice issues are not accidental, especially in a democratic society. It's very much um, philosophical. And I think uh, it becomes, like how do we wanna encounter really challenging issues that we are facing today? And how we wanna create a future that is different based on where we are. Uh, it's not an easy, thing to do. Like, uh, I feel like a lot of times social challenges become overwhelming in a way that we don't know how to access that space. And I think be, being able to come to a spaces that you can embody that, you know, thoughts or thinking is an important way of, of entering these very complex um, uh, issues and coming to it from a very positive space of building. And, and love and care. Uh, and that's why I, I say it's philosophical because, um, because when there is injustice, it's not only the responsibility of people who have been impacted by it to create voice for it. I think this, this work is a, really a call 
um, and there is a web platform that everybody could go, so I, inc I encourage all of you to do so. Uh, so kind of thinking about how we can communally uh, come and experience something, but also give voice to it through our own personal memories and histories. Uh, is, is, I think um, that's an important part of it. But also, uh, when, when I'm witnessing those narrative and stories, it's so profound, like the fathers that I have been talking to, uh, that they've been so uh, generous in like, sharing their um, heartfelt stories and narrative, the fathers who have been absent. I have, uh, I, um, uh, some of them are here tonight and I thank you for that. Um, so I think like we don't have that opportunity. Also, like that's another thing too with the criminality is that like we don't have the opportunity to hear those voices and, and encounter each other in a very real, uh, caring and humane way. And in this narrative, I was very interested in tell, like knowing what was the stories of the men who have been absent was and what was their childhood like. What is what was it for them to grow up as a child? And what was it for them, for their children to grow up uh, not having their fathers around? And I think that's, that's what I constantly think about. And, and, um, and also, like, it's a very important part to think about children and the parents and that nuclear of love and care, um, that nuclear center. Because as, as a country, again, like we've been using that, it's been, you know, it's happening now and it's been happening from the earlier time. Uh, like it's been one of the methodologies that we use uh, in, for kind of oppressing, uh, dismantling the, the, the family nuclear or like separating parents and children. And, and, I, and that's why I say it's philosophical because I think we need to encounter it and we need to accept it that we are doing that. And I think the only way that we could do it is to actually come close to it and feel it. Um, yeah, so I think the, per the personal stories are what it makes that sort of a space and, and make you witness that a space. And one thing I want to make sure that the audience knows is that in Rasheen's um, installation upstairs, there's a three-channel video, and then on one wall, which is mirrored, there are these small panels, and if you touch those panels, so you see yourself in the panel, and then you touch it, and a light comes on, and in the headphones is about a nine-minute uh, first-person a uh, person telling you their story, telling you some of the stories that Rasheen has collected. Um, and there's three different stories up there. So I just encourage everyone to take the time, maybe not during the opening when it's not so busy, um, to really listen to those. And I think that sense of deep witnessing is, is really present, especially in that part of your installation. Um, this project has grown so much since you started it in 2017. And um, there are really so many future paths and potential ideas that you've shared with me. Um, and it's really a project that it, it's kind of so alive. Um, even as we were installing the show, you were like, oh, there's this and this, and there's this project I'm working on. And one thing that I've been really struck by is your discussion about using virtual reality as a co-creative tool, as this kind of next idea you have for the project. Um, so I just wondered if you wanted to share with the audience kind of where you see this project going next. I should have asked Jeff if, if it's okay to, <laughs> to yes, all right. <laughs> and also Kevin is there too. Um, so, so something that is very important part of my practice is the process and constantly thinking about how that process could be in a space of giving, how the process could be in a space of uh, connection and, and bringing people together and collaborators together and how that a space could be a way of, uh, for example, in this particular piece, how that process could actually bring fathers and children together, or fathers and families together. One of the one of the m most uh, difficult challenges that we've been talking to, you know, Jeff is here, Kevin is here. They are like amazing people who work with with fathers who are coming out. Um, Kevin is here, who's. Um, 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 so, one of the one of the most uh, difficult challenges is the the fa fathers being absent for such a long time, that not only coming out and having to deal with a lot of 
uh, realistic fact of coming back to the society when there are a lot of obstacles for you to, to reintegrate. But also that a space of love is almost gone because uh, they have been away for such a long time. And, and even though that they are the father and they feel that they are father, but they have to sort of rebuild that connection and, and with their family, and that's emotional connection. And that's such an important sort of grounding uh, for for them that they talk about. Um, so, uh, what we what we are um, thinking uh, or we are doing now actually, Jeff is uh, working with the federal uh, prison facility in um, New Hampshire, working with some fathers who are will be released in the next eighteen months in the city of Boston, and. Uh, kind of thinking about how we can bring the tools and the new technology. I'm really interested in, I, I have the background in painting. So I come to this space from a very visual, visceral space of kind of thinking about the stories as paints and colors. And, and um, But then I'm really interested in technology in how we could use that as a way of creating new spaces for investigation and connection and, and encounter. And also, uh, like how those technology could help us bring us more closer to our bodies, even. Um, so, virtual reality is a very interesting uh, space for encounter. Uh, but like any other medium, you have to use it in a in a right way. So, I'm really interested in co-creation, thinking about how we could uh, use that and work with the family who are outside waiting for the. Uh, for the fathers to come back, and also for the fathers who are inside, like how we could use this tool as a way of sharing stories and narratives and memories and songs, but also then how that space could be shared with the broader audience that, that we could be moved by those stories and think about this space in a more critical way coming from that emotional space. That's like great. A, is that such important work? Yeah, okay. that's perfect. Thank you so much. Um, let's flip forward to Helga's slides. So in your many decades of working as an artist, I just include these two low res images to show that you've worked in a lot of different um, kinds. You've made lots of different series of work. Uh, Hyper-realistic architectural facades, you've made paintings of plants and botanicals. But if you flip to the next slide, you'll see the um, small scale abstract watercolor paintings that we have on view here at the ICA and that you've been working on for about a decade. And I was interested in what sort of um, led you to pursue making these works in particular for so long. And what has the watercolor medium in particular really given you uh, as an artist? I think watercolor has really been my medium because this was the first medium I really used as a child. My father was the one who gave me the first watercolors. Naturally, I have tried many other mediums and as I mentioned before, even acrylics, but I always switched back to watercolor. But mainly, watercolor has not been used, and I mean watercolor, not squash or egg, but egg tempera and distempera. I'm talking transparent watercolors, which I use. I don't have any opaque colors on my palette. And I enjoy and try to use that, especially because I like challenges, and they are not, I haven't seen anybody else using watercolor in abstract the way I do. And I have been giving myself challenges because it isn't easy to do it uh, on a, I painted on a large scale, which was much, much more difficult because to keep the even colors, hard edge painting is very difficult. You need kind of moisture because I don't use any much water in my medium, in my watercolor itself. It's, it's mostly the pigment. Uh, you have to have temperature around you, which is a little bit moist to keep the areas even in large scale. So this is really why I have now managed somehow to do it on a more smaller scale because it is easier, but there's still challenges. If I worked from sketches, it was more difficult. 
I didn't, couldn't achieve the movement, the colors I wanted, the sh shapes I wanted, because you can't correct it. In oil, I could correct it. In watercolor, I cannot. So if I make a mistake and it doesn't come out right away the way I want it, I have to either change my mind completely. And this is where, the, like I said again, the, I, I do a lot of very, very, very many collages. And already on a collages, I am able to see a little bit of the push and pull and movement. But I sometimes cannot really translate it into watercolor because you still cannot get the same strong colors. And naturally, colors, as you know, depend from other adjacent colors. So you have to take all that into, into mind, into the way I look at it. And I see things abstractly, which comes very easy to me because I saw abstractly already as a child. When I looked at things, because I, as I mentioned on my video, my father took me to a con constructivist uh, exhibition, but I didn't finish the story because when I came home, I thought I can do it too at age three. <laughs> so I found a box, a large box of spools with threads, but they were wooden at that time. I took them on a balcony and started taking one after the other over the balcony edge until they went oops, down, another one, another one, another one. And it created a beautiful painting because some of the threads stayed on top because there were weeds there and those wooden pieces went down and I was so proud I went out. <laughs> I did a construction, but I went to my mother. Didn't go over very well. <laughs> It was considered to be very, it was a mischievous thing, but my father went like this and said, great. And this is why every time I talk about painting, I talk about my father because he was somebody who wanted to paint and was actually in art school, but landed up in law, was a lawyer, judge. My mother was never interested in painting very much. I guess she was always afraid my father might go back into painting, <laughs> not be a judge anymore. <laughs> and uh, this is my past of my painting. What I'm doing right now, I really enjoy because I, 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 I feel I, am been I have been able to make my pieces move because this, these are the comments I get from people that I look at your work and it moves. And every time I look at it, it, it has a different position and different things. And a lot of that comes strictly very spontaneous. Sometimes I don't even know where it comes from. Why do I do it? Especially when I do the collages, I don't think at all what I'm doing. It's just automatic pointing. And my daughter would say the word serendipity. So here's an example where the collage is on the left and the finished painting is on the right, just to give you a sense of that kind of process of translation as part of Helga's process. So that's the comment that I also get most often when I'm walking people through so far is, you know, there's so much movement in these. There's a sense of them coming out and pushing back and projection and recession. And I always like to think of it in my mind, because um, you have such an, uh, an incredible life story of a series of displacements and movement. And I think about stories you've told me of looking out the train window when you were leaving Estonia, going to Vienna. Um, or arriving in Montreal. And I just wonder if, do you feel like your interest in a kind of visual perceptual movement is ever in any way connected to your life's movement? Yes, and there's another movement. I listen a lot to p uh, piano music. I can't play piano, but I like, for instance, if I la listen to Chopin, which my husband loved naturally to the music, there's a lot of movement there. Mm -hmm. And when I use it, when I paint, I sometimes, listen to it, quite often listen to it, and especially Chopin list, because there's a lot of movement there. And even music has color, uh, at least to me when I think of it. There are different sounds, different things. It's fast, it's, it's slow, it's quiet. It can be, you can think about it. It's quieting, but at the same time, again, it could be very exciting. So it, music has something to do with it. Uh, 
but I have said it before, there's so much around you, it's always movement, and, and uh, there's always life around you. So I think it does influence you. Naturally, I have seen a lot of sadness because I'm a survivor of the Second World War, but I have been fortunate enough to be able to put it in the back and just try to be happy, look at the wonderful things which, and the good things which happened. I'm a little concerned right now what is happening in the world <laughs> because uh, in a way it's a, a, a repeat for me. I have lived through it and I think I see it maybe a little bit more clearly and once in a while when I watch television I just have to turn it off. And it has affected my painting apparently because right now I made many collages and my daughter said, and my granddaughter, both of them, when they looked at it, said, oh, it's dark colors, it's very interesting. <laughs> Maybe the dark colors have to do with my attitude. Mm. That's great. Um, before I open it up to the audience for a few questions, I just, if we could flip to the next slide. I just want to draw your attention to um, our amazing staff here has made four video portraits, studio visits with these four artists. They all were gracious enough to invite us into their space and work with us on these videos. And I really would encourage everybody to go to our website and um, see them. They're all around four minutes long and they're just really wonderful uh, portraits of these four really incredible people. So thank you so much. And let's open it up for um, questions before we end. Turn up the house lights a little bit. Any questions in the audience? Yes. Can you? Did you raise your hand? Yeah. Are you feeling nervous now? Anybody? Oh, she didn't mean to. Okay. That's okay. That's awesome. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Gabrielle. Yeah. Um, th thank you, all of you, for, for being here and Ruth for moderating the wonderful talk. Um, I'm really interested in, in rituals. And when you go in, into the studio or, or you go out to paint or, or to, to edit or whatever your process of creation is, is there a particular ritual that you have to go through? All my answers are very basic. Uh, I wake up. <laughs> I, I wake up. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I... Sometimes a little late. Some, some, sometimes, oh, sometimes a little late. late. <laughs> Mostly if it's, it's either if I worked the night before or uh, maybe I stayed in the studio a little too long. Um, but I pretty much, I wake up and I paint. Uh, if it was a ritual, it would be I wake up, I get, I make coffee, <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I go to work. Uh, I dream a lot about the work, so it's kind of like I'm working before I get to the studio, so I don't have to warm up or any of those things. I don't need certain uh, music or anything. I need to be in a good place. That helps. Uh, if everything in my life is going pretty smoothly, I paint every day. When it's chaotic, then I stop, and then I go drink. But, <laughs> but if everything is cool, I just I go right to the studio. I need to try to paint. I paint just about every day. So uh, if I don't paint, then I'm a little grumpy. And, and coworkers know when I'm in my mood at work, it's probably because I didn't paint. And so I apologize. <laughs> Uh, pick that a little bit. Um, so I think, you know, as a, as a studio artist, I think that practice is more in, in, in the sense that you have to kind of like have a routine and you go in. But I think with the work that I'm doing now, it's the opposite of ritual, even though the work itself is a ritual. So it's very interesting kind of uh, 
position uh, in a way that like, I feel like everything that I'm listening to, it's a very ritualistic way of encountering all of these stories and narratives and, and memories and songs. And, and I have to live with them for, for, for quite a long time in a way that they, they just like, I, it's almost living with them. Like I I'm, sort of memorize all of these songs, even people who have worked with me. Like um, it become ritualistic in that way that like you live with those uh, people and you love them. And, and, and I can't say that again, like that's, that's true with everybody, like the sound artists that they work with me and the editor. So we kind of know the people before even meet them, uh, for them that they haven't met them. But in terms of the, the encounter of the work is very chaotic in a way that I work with the community. So it's actually the, op the opposite. Like I, I have to constantly adjust and, and it's a, like a dance with other people's schedule and time. And uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a really, um, it's, it's hard to get that ritualistic going. Uh, you have to kind of segregate it and, and, and have this sort of time that you spend outside and you spend inside. Or the, the car has become a lot of like my, my ritual because I, I listen to a lot of the things that I collect uh, in, in the car actually. <laughs> I don't know if any of you. <laughs> <laughs> Monica, yeah, last question. No, it's a little past eight. There's yes. Um, so question for me. I, um, so in, um, in doing this exhibition, I, uh, as, as many people know, I set myself the goal of doing 50 studio visits in Boston in about a year. So I know a lot of the artists that also shared time with me are here tonight. So I really appreciate that. And um, you know, I really tried, I had recommendations from other artists, from curators, from people that I met with, and I just had this ever growing list and I would look online at their work and then set up the studio visits with those artists that I wanted to. And what I would say is that my experience of going in so many studios across Boston, all over in all different neighborhoods, um, many artists are not able to afford space in Boston anymore, so they went further afield. Um, I really was struck by just, when you cut across the kind of ecosystem, like there is no one way to be an artist in Boston. And people were making ends meet and making work and figuring out how to find that creative space in so many different ways. And so after I did the studio visits um, and I had the really hard task of figuring out which four artists you know, were gonna be presented and recipients of the prize, I was really, I wanted a, an exhibition that reflected my experience of cutting, you know, through that arts ecosystem in Boston. And I chose these artists because of the quality of their work. And I also chose them because I felt like they reflected the many paths uh, that artists, young and old, trained and untrained, teachers and not teaching, uh, might take to, to, to make a livelihood and to live as an artist in Boston. So I think that, um, I was really conscious in doing my studio visits of, you know, cutting across um, all different kinds of categories and practices and medium, and that just, I think, is reflected in then, because of who I visited, who ended up being the recipients of the prize. Uh, but I really feel like, in a way, this show, I think, is actually incredibly reflective of, um, of, of how people are, what, the art, what, what is to be an artist in Boston. I think the diversity reflected on stage and in the exhibition is actually pretty reflective of the field um, in Boston writ large. So uh, our reception and galleries are open until 9 p.m. tonight, so please uh, keep the party going, go upstairs and visit the shows again, and thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> <laughs>